Imagine, if you will, the average middle-class American man living in 1955. He is white, as are most Americans. He is male, for they were the center of American public and political life. Despite where he was born and from what environment raised him, he has found his way to a newly constructed middle-class neighborhood. It is adjacent to the relatively clean city center to which he commutes via car every weekday morning. He works a respectable job within the new post-war American economic boom. He has more than likely served his country in an overseas battle, either Korea or the big one. He has a wife at home and two children for which he dutifully provides. He takes pride in his family and especially he takes pride in the hard work that affords him his life. Every morning as he pulls out of the driveway, he looks at this nice suburban house, a house in which his parents could have only dreamed of living. He feels a sense of satisfaction and purpose knowing that he afforded himself this life all on his own. As he drives slowly through his tree-lined cul-de-sac, he waves at his neighbors. He knows all of their names. They are members of his bowling league or the VFW. Most go to the same church and play golf at the same club. They too are making their way to their cars for their commute to work, kissing their wives who are dressed in the height of department store fashion, even at this early hour. He waves to his friends and is glad that most of them will be attending his weekend barbecue. They will swap stories about their work, about Eisenhower, about golf, and about which John Wayne movie they love the most. As he leaves the neighborhood that morning, every front door is unlocked, every house attended within by pleasant wives who are going about the work of making a clean and welcoming home for the future generation of American children. Now imagine that man wakes up one morning to have been magically transported to our time. 60 years later, his family and job have transported with him, but everything else is radically different. The father's commute is much more dangerous than he ever remembered, with vagrancy, decay, and violence common sights through his windows. He would learn quick that he needed to arm himself and his property to not only lock his car doors, but activate alarm systems and wheel jacks. He never should look anyone in the eye on the streets, and maybe sometimes, if it's late, he should pack a piece. That first day in his office, he would walk right in while smoking a cigarette, calling the woman he assumed was his secretary little lady as a harmless sign of affection and comment to his bosses how proud he was to work at an institution that hired Negroes and Orientals. Every one of these things he has done freely in his own era as evidence of his genuinely felt magnanimous tolerance. Now this is all grounds for termination, for it only led to offense by those he thought he was championing. By the end of his workday, he's too scared to communicate with any co-worker at all, lest he step on some sort of other hidden land and mind of identity politics. To him, it seemed that everyone in his office drudges through their oppressively boring workload in a lonely, isolated space that is firmly reinforced by these new, unwritten codes only designed to divide us. After his punishingly lonely workday, he drives his treacherous journey home to discover that his wife has had an equally harrowing day. She told the story of being mocked at the grocery store, pointed at and snickered, for she was outfitted in a presentable dress and hat, while all the other shoppers were dressed in tight-fitting shorts and beach clothing. Slothing through the aisles of frozen, pre-cooked food, they shove into their children's faces to shut them up. One woman even made her feel bad for choosing to be a homemaker instead of abandoning her kids to go to work for herself at some job. But the kids told stories about their day in the public schools that scared mom and dad more than anything. They had to enter the school through metal detectors, dodge violence and drug dealings in the hallways, to attend a class that taught the children that premarital sex and even homosexual sodomy was natural and permissible in society. They were even forced to read a book about how the homosexual lifestyle was happy and rewarding. Everyone was taking pictures of their genitals with their phones and sending it to each other instead of listening to the math teacher or running laps in PE. This turned everyone's stomachs. After they finished dinner, they sat down to watch television. There was no longer any neighborhood bowling leagues or reading groups to enrich the family's night. The neighborhoods no longer even knew each other's names. They all seemed lonely-eyed, possibly drugged out on pills or worse. Few of the men even seemed to work at all, most saying proudly that they were just living off unemployment and playing video games all day. Grown men, as they sat in front of the television, a stream of depravity and pornography poured through the screen. America had become a hell world. But how did this happen? 
How did such a great country like America come so debauched and horrible? It now seemed to his family like a third world country. Someone made this happen. Someone had to have caused this. The scenario we just watched was originally put together by a very influential conservative think tank fixture by the name of William Lind. Lind has an answer for this very question, for the question of what happened to American greatness. His culprit was not a vague group of people too broad to seem like anything but finger pointing like blaming all liberals. And it also wasn't over people's heads like blaming late stage capitalism or world trade. It wasn't even directly racist like, you know, blaming people. He blames the philosophers of the Frankfurt School, a simple cohesive villain to direct your ire upon, a small but infective group of alien conspirators of which you have probably totally unaware of to this day. Now according to this theory, this group of communist German Jews educated in philosophy, psychology, and the arts fled the Holocaust in their native Germany in the mid-30s to set up residence not in the Soviet Union, where they would have presumably found an agreeable home, but into the cradle of World War II American culture, into the highest echelons of New York intellectual society, and into Hollywood, California itself. Please, enter. All are welcome. According to Lynn, through guile and manipulation, these Marxist thinkers were able to infect the Hollywood studio system, academia, and the world of book publishing to shape a counterculture movement of anti-Western culture that sought to uphold the values of Karl Marx and the leaders of the Bolshevik party like Lenin and Stalin. Even more insidiously, they also set about on a covert project to subvert and destroy the pre-existing American cultural values. Those values that shaped the historic rise of American states and won the Great War. They would remake the American people, making them soft for Soviet indoctrination. Despite some men's best efforts, men like the chairs of the Huac and Joseph McCarthy, they prospered under our noses. These were the same writers who fed the destabilized counterculture of the 1960s. They were indirectly responsible for the rise of Barack Obama and this toxic SJW culture that has devastated America these last few years. They did this away from the prying eyes of hardworking traditional Americans within the university system, within those same marbled columns to which the average American bankrupts them themselves to send their kids. There, they infected the children to turn against their country, their faith, and their family. Later, they were able to infect greater society. They were able to do this within the opulent executive boardrooms, those smug writers' rooms full of Ivy League perverts and communists, and in the orgiastic recording studios of major cultural institutions like blockbuster movies and chart-topping music. Those things that have destroyed the very communities that made this country so strong. And a goal to replace the average American white man with a sniveling beta communist. Now this theory was soon brought to the wide conservative public by legendary paleoconservative and friend of Lynn's, Patrick Buchanan, in his 2002 book, The Death of the West. This brought the Frankfurt School to the attention of the late er father of the future MAGA industrial complex, the great snowbird of the hard right, Andrew Breitbart. In his book, Moralizing Coke Fiend, he said that discovering the story of the Frankfurt School was his red pill. It was his great epiphany. This realization explained everything he needed to know about what had happened to this country. And for two years before his death from fucking living it to a hundred, Andrew Breitbart preached the gospel of the Frankfurt School at Tea Party rallies all throughout this country. In 2011, the Wright's obsession with the Frankfurt School stumbled upon to dangerously sick results. On July 22nd, Anders Brevik blew up a van in Oslo, Norway, killing eight people. He then made his way to the island of Utoya, where he kidnapped and murdered 69 kids attending a summer camp. Before performing these disgusting accounts of murder, he uploaded a 1,500-page manifesto called 2083, A Declaration of European Independence. Brevik cites whole passages of Lynn's writings and shows a thorough grasp of the many books cited by Lynn for further reading. According to Brevik, 
back, Lin opened his eyes to the reality of cultural Marxism in his own continent, most currently through the guise of what he sees as rapid European Islamification. He goes into it deeper. I mean, it was 1,500 pages long, so yeah, he goes deeper. He was basically Kevin Spacey from Seven. He plagiarizes Lind, seamlessly supplanting Lind's own words for Brevix and a justification for his hideous mass murder. Now don't get me wrong, I don't bring this up to blame Lind for the murders of 69 Norwegian children, but I bring this up to point to the power of Lind's theory. Now, of course, after an insane psycho murderer was revealed to be entranced by this conspiracy, it became verboten to openly admit to supporting this theory, right? Theme with cultural Marxism. Modernist, moral no relativist, critical theory espousing, cultural Marxist, nihilist, began to see Before I address Lynn's conspiracy theory as a whole piece of right-wing American scaremongering, let's talk about the actual Frankfurt School. Here's a quick video. Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Walter Benjamin and others had come together in an independent institute set up at Frankfurt University in the aftermath of the First World War. The Frankfurt School is a- Um, uh, okay, you know what, I do this for the clicks, so maybe let's wait on that. Let's focus on the story's main character for starters. Though some of the thoughts we are going to ascribe to Lind is surely an outrage as old as Joseph McCarthy, HUAC, the John Birch Society, the Silent Majority, and even earlier than that. This attack against the Frankfurt School directly was founded thoroughly by Lind, a mainstay of the paleoconservative movement. Educated at both Dartmouth and Princeton, Lind went straight to Washington after receiving his master's degree, working as a legislative aide for centrist senators like Robert Taft and Gary Hart. He even wrote a prescription book on military restructuring with Hart, a very prominent Democrat and a premier adherent to a post-Great Society hawkish neoliberalism. This moved his career into being a leading military mind on the right. Like many think tank military minds of the late 20th century, Lind never served a day in uniform, not even during Vietnam for which he was of fighting age. He did, however, develop a controversial theory of warfare, labeled fourth generational war, which calls for a military not just trained in fighting tactics and strategies, but also an understanding of the culture and the politics of an area to better dominate and neutralize all asymmetric threats. This isn't much different than other counterterrorism theories, such as those of David Petraeus, except instead of putting an emphasis on cultural openness and flexibility towards the occupied nation's culture, fourth generational warfare does the opposite. War is a clash of cultures, and the defensive goal of any military side is to protect the culture. Not lives, not locations, culture. It puts his focus on maintaining a hard pro-Western civilization mindset, a traditional American mindset, one which we are willing to inject into a conflict to ideologically neutralize any other ideology that pervades your enemy. To Lind, America never really left the Cold War. We are still fighting many, many Cold Wars under the guise of culture clashes. In fact, we are at war with every culture anathema to the version of a Western civilization he is so desperate to protect. In his 2009 book, Victoria, a novel of the fourth generational war, written under a pseudonym, his ideas are best described as comparable to the notorious Turner Diaries, just updated for the Obama era. I hope this gives you an idea of what his thoughts on military containment are. It is possible that during his formulations of these theses on war, William Lind came to his understanding of the critical theory of history, its parents, and those members of the Frankfurt School. At some point around this time, Lind joined the Free Congress Foundation and started his long working relationship with the conservative think tank's main founder, Paul Weirich, long considered a major figure on the religious right. It is in this point in time, during the Clintonian mid-90s, in this think tank, that the phrase cultural Marxism is reborn. I say reborn because the term, with only a slight mutation, had existed before. Culture Bolshevismus. translated from German to simply mean cultural Bolshevism, was first used to describe the artwork of people like European artists Max Ernst and Max Beckmann as decadent and communist in content. This charge was levied by none other than Adolf Hitler in the pages of Mein Kampf. 
Soon enough, in the whirlwind of Nazi Germany, culture Bolshevismus became a ridiculous nonsense term used to round up and provoke anyone from actual artists to scientists to just basically Jewish people of all stripes. The idea seemed to have died with the Nazis until unearthed by Lind and Weyrich in the mid-90s as an attack on that era's growing liberal class and against the academic, globalist, neoconservatives that were infecting the right wing of his party. That is when the text we are discussing now in this video was written. The text is called Political Correctness, A Short History of an Ideology. And it's not really a book at all, but a 50-page pamphlet of sorts, mostly distributed for no charge and more edited by William Lind than written by him. It was accompanied with a video that is now available on YouTube, so I would encourage you to go look at it for yourself. So let's crack into this work, shall we? Chapter 1 starts, as this video did, with the time-traveling wholesome 50s dad, explaining like I did that something has broken American civilization over the last decades. Lynn goes on to name this ideology political correctness, a phrase he claims first arose amongst the Bolsheviks, Pinkos, and fellow travelers of early communism to denote a right-thinking Marxist. Though we are now all too familiar with the overused, almost nonsense slander of political correctness, Lind calls it the prevailing philosophy in America, one so complex and pernicious that he compiled this free pamphlet to address and educate America in its perniciousness. For America should be a land free of ideology because ideology is what is truly toxic. Lind then starts giving a history of the foundation of the Frankfurt School. Founded in 1923 in the University of Frankfurt, the Institute of Social Research was forged under a mission to free men not just of capitalism's material oppressions, but of the mental and spiritual oppression of capitalism as well. Lind points out that one of the founders of this institute was Hungarian thinker George Lukács, who Lind claims to have stated that the goal of the school was to answer the question, who will save us from Western civilization. And I'll come back to focus on Lukács in this statement later. Lind then outlines five points on which this political correctness or critical theory or cultural Marxist actually aligns with classical Marxism to prove that they are actually one and the same. Number one, Lin chooses to say here almost blandly without evidence that Marxism is against human nature because people are different and Marxism has to use force to make people behave within a system that demands conformity. And to be fair, looking upon Marxism as practiced by Stalin and Mao, who could blame him to have come to that conclusion, but this isn't the totality of all Marxist practice and he knows it. And now he points to the prevalence of campus PC culture as proof of a Frankfurtian totalitarianism. It seems that comparing collegiate use of person-first language to the Stalinist purges seems a tad extreme to me, but that is the actual point that he's making. Number two, both ideologies have a single factor explanation for history. With economic Marxism, the power in any society lies with those that control the means of production. With cultural Marxism, history is explained by which group has power over another group, as defined by race, sex, orientation, etc. Lynn actually says in the text, sexual normality or abnormality, yuck. Okay, number three, both define whole groups of people as virtuous or evil a priori without regard to any actual behavior. Marxists lionize the proletariat and workers while villainizing the bourgeois and the owners of capital. Political correctness similarly defines all racial and sexual minorities virtuous while labeling white men as evil. Number four, the fourth parallel is expropriation. Communists take land from the bourgeoisie and the nobles and gave it to the state. Cultural Marxism seeks to take away cultural capital and power from the white man to give it to minorities in the forms of quotas, welfare, and affirmative action. Number five, both rigidly employ a method of analysis designed to show their own correctness no matter the facts presented. Marxism does this through economics, I assume he means dialectical materialism, and the PC cultural Marxists do this through deconstruction, proving that any text illustrates the oppression of minorities, etc. Both methods, Lin says, are phony analyses that twist evidence to fit the preordained conclusions, but they 
lend a scientific air to the ideology. Lind finishes this first chapter by saying that PC culture looms over American society like a colossus. The only way we can fight this is through open defiance. He wants you to use those words that PC culture forbids. Refuse to use their words. Remember that sex is stronger than gender. They must defend the fact, and I'm quoting here, that black people cause a disproportionate amount of crime. And let the math slip a little on that statement. And you must point out that AIDS is voluntary and actually acquired by immoral acts. And never, ever send your kids to public school still live as that guy from the 1950s. Don't let go of your culture. Defend it like a city under siege, behind walls and razor wire and abatis and caltrops and snipers. That will defend you from Lukács and the Frankfurt School. The hour is late, he says, but the battle is not yet lost. Something is happening to our town. And I think we can all see where it's coming from. Let's bring it down here for a minute and talk about chapter two. Chapter two is called The Historic Rise of Political Correctness and was written by Raymond Rain. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. A World War II fighter pilot and Texas cattle rancher. This chapter is a woefully shallow jump into the well of actual Frankfurt School philosophy, tracking their early aims and goals to our modern culture. He follows the revolutionary impulse from Marx to his obvious link with Soviet Bolsheviks and those upstart communist governments that arose in Eastern Europe in the 1910s and 20s, those like the Bavarian Soviet and Lukács' own Belakun in Hungary. After these flash revolutions quickly died away, he follows this Marxist impulse to the Frankfurt School and their trek to America and the countercultural movements of the 1960s. Oddly enough, he starts this discussion on the Frankfurt School by dragging in a European Marxist who in no way is connected to the Frankfurt School. Antonio Gramsci was an Italian politician and philosopher, ultimately fated to die in a Mussolini jail cell. Ron cites that his main philosophical idea is that Western culture and capitalism have shaped men to be allergic to those social reforms that would improve their lives. In order to create a new communist man, you would have to shape him through education and culture. Ron goes on to associate Gramsci with the aforementioned George Lukács, again calling him a founder of the French Frankfurt School, which is, I suppose, sort of true. He was certainly associates and comrades with the actual founders of the Frankfurt School, Karl Grunberg, Felix Vail, and Frederick Pollock. And he did participate in several earlier symposiums that the Institute organized, but he was never a part of the Institute in any official way. He was too busy being an active political figure in the Hungarian Bela Kuhn party. After this time period, Lukács spent the rest of his life somewhere between a literary philosopher and a Stalinist frenemy? To my very uninformed eye, he seems like a communist Theon Greyjoy, constantly in a cycle of rebelling against and repenting to greater forces that want to grind him down, surviving the authoritarian World War II regimes and the Stalinist purges, but never really with much dignity intact. But his ideas were bold for the time and pertinent to the story Ron is trying to establish in this book. Lukács' most famous work, The Theory of the Novel, belongs next to those on the Frankfurt School. The key piece of Lukács' philosophy that Lind focuses on is that of the scary sounding cultural terrorism. Essentially fostering radical expressions of Marx's social theory to shock society into a dialectical action. Ron focuses on Lukács' radical sexual teachings during his short-lived time as the cultural minister of the Bela Kuhn government. Teachings Ron accuses him of having to give to children. Things like free love, homosexuality, avoiding marriage, and traditional marriage structures were taught. Also Lukács pushed a radical feminist agenda as well. And from there, Ron takes us into the actual Frankfurt School thinkers. He focuses first on Theodore Adorno's book, The Authoritarian Personality, and one can see why Ron's interpretation of this book would offend every conservative's sensibilities. According to him, Adorno believed that fascists and authoritarian impulses arose from Christianity, capitalism, and patriarchy. Ron muses that his book led to the rise of an anti-prejudice dogma that states that all discrimination is evil and leads to the Holocaust. This is the foundation of political correctness. This, uh, 
actually criminally understands Adorno, who focused more on foundational dangerous interplay of the Freudian id and the superego occurring in many authoritarian systems, he is right that the book is very influential in the decades that followed, inspiring a lot of anti-discrimination training procedures implemented in these last decades, but he gets the main crux of Adorno's message totally wrong. After this, he makes his way to the member of the Frankfurt School most famous in American history, Herbert Marcuse. Like Rain, I actually agree that no Frankfurtian has had a greater impact on the late 20th century American character than Marcuse. You don't need a college course to understand the change he brought to the American left. Before Marcuse, the left was marked by the everyman, the popular front, the folk singer singing songs of the people, organizing the factory workers and farmers co-ops, people like Eugene Debs, Helen Keller, John Reed, Woody Guthrie, and Norman Thomas, earnest, suited types, many religiously committed to social change, self-serious people, almost masking the radical ideas that they worked to enact. But after Marcuse and his advocacy of the great refusal, the new American left was born. The wild, the uninhibited, the hippie, the crunchy, patchouli-stinking refusenik that has been a parody of the radical left since the publication of Marcuse's masterpiece, The One-Dimensional Man. Marcuse saw the world of post-war America, that world painted at the beginning of this video, that world of the greatest generation, as a system of capitalistic oppression designed to commodify you and to keep you docile. To quote Marcuse, the American boomer generation was an entire generation of pumping gas, gas. waiting tables, waiting slaves, tables. With white slaves with white collars. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. The middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. We're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. Yeah. Great Refusal was the fight club, or was the drum circle with an ounce of weed, and to Ron, this was a concerted perversion of Western culture's status quo, the status quo that made America great in the first place. Also, Marcusa wrote a lot of things about fucking that Ron views as destructive to society as well. In his equally seminal book called Eros and Civilization, Marcusa had a similar reading of sex as he did to consumer culture. The power structure represses the sexual urges and proclivities of the poor lest they interfere with production. This was read as an advocacy of sexual liberation and free love, another element of destruction for the consensus of American order. Finally, Ron attacks a friend of Marcuse's and the only real household name we will discuss in this chapter, Abraham Maslow, and his hierarchy of needs, which Ron sees as infected with Frankfurtian theory. But Maslow's theories are probably the only thinking in this chapter that is directly taught to children in high school. I was, at least. I quote it to my children whenever they need a toy at Target. Ron also points out that these theories were influential to Betty Friedan in her feminist manifesto, The Feminine Mystique, so there we have it. Take a bow. We now have seven degrees of Karl Marx, connecting World War I philosopher George Lukács to Anita Sarkeesian. You now see it before you. Cultural Marxism as a decades-long project to turn your kids into docile communist foot soldiers, just as Gromsky wanted. Chapter 3 is on college political correctness, written by former Reagan advisor Ken Cribb Jr. Absolutely nothing new is shared here about this topic that hasn't drummed to death in every media venue over the last three decades, but I do find one thing interesting enough to mention about this chapter. This chapter was clearly written in the early to mid-90s. They mocked the campus climate of the Gen X generation and their culturally enforced presumptions that say blacks are not genetically more violent than whites, or that homosexuals 
homosexuality is not a grave sin. So a couple of decades removed from the original writing of this, I now see that it's not crazy to assume that those bitching that college campuses are restraining their free speech and demanding that they reject the notion that gender is binary and that safe spaces are anti-white could seem like ridiculous troglodytes in just a few decades by any sane person's assumption. Chapter 4 is also a snooze and a half. It's written by someone named Jamie McDonald, and that's pretty much all I got on him. It unsuccessfully attempts to A, understand the philosophy of Jacques Derrida, and B, show how it's really just fancy smart people magic tricks to enforce hashtag white genocide. I'm not going to dispute that Derrida was an academic force for the political left, but I think he's only brought into this book to modernize the conspiracy theory on the Frankfurt School. At the time that this pamphlet was written, Derrida was still alive and seemingly of immense academic academic importance. Oddly enough, Derrida was not even directly associated with the Frankfurt School's thinking at all, and was not even a proponent of state communism. But he was a late 20th century leftist philosopher, so for Lind and others, that's enough to put him in the category of conspirators. Chapter 5, however, is worth a quick look. It's on a subject I find oft neglected here on YouTube, the subject of modern feminism. This one was written by retired Navy Commander Gerald Atkinson, who seems to have spent his retirement writing that the movement towards women in the military was a Frankfurtian conspiracy. The article starts with a quick history, going all the way back to Seneca Falls and bringing us to the cultural Marxist desert of the now. The new idea of this paper in particular is that feminism is not a tool to give women more power in society and culture. It is not about representation or even repropriation. It is about Marxist destruction. Feminism is about feminization, for men and masculinity are a danger to the indoctrination of the masses. And now we are back with Adorno and his book, The Authoritarian Personality. To quote the author, the concept of the authoritarian personality is not just to be interpreted primarily as a model for the conduct of warfare against prejudice as such, it is a handbook for psychological warfare against the American male, to render him unwilling to defend traditional beliefs and values. In other words, the aim of the Frankfurtians was to emasculate men. Atkinson also cites how Eric Fromm, another prominent Frankfurtian, wrote The Art of Loving as a manual for separating our cultural concept of love from the act of sex. This has the effect of not only creating a promiscuous culture, which is a problem into itself to Atkinson, but also making expressions of love now maternal and feminine. The, um... <clears throat> harder expressions of love were now devalued, coded as destructive power of an authoritarian. To Eric Fromm, all masculinity is now toxic masculinity. To his credit, Lind ends this whole booklet with a reading list of primary sources and sympathetic histories of the school and the movement it created. As cited earlier, Anders Breivik definitely followed Lind's advice in reading these sources. Many have, in fact. It's hard to say that those that take this conspiratorial view of the Frankfurt School are not steeped in their thought. They are well read. Currently, most books written about the Frankfurt School are about this theory. This theory that Adorno and Marcusa and Fromm and Lukács conspired to create a revolution of cultural Marxists, to destroy Western civilization and weaken us all for, I don't know, Soviet indoctrination, I guess? Or absolute boy-style socialism, or Barack Obama, or Bernie Sanders, I'm not sure. But, but really bad stuff, guys. Just really bad stuff. And that, dear listener, is why you feel like a stranger in your own country. Why you feel lonely and scared and poor of spirit. You were targeted for destruction by these men. You know in your heart that it used to not be this way. And now, thanks to Lynn, you finally have answers to why it changed. But you know I'm going to ask this question. Do you really? Let's do the breakdown on this. <laughs> I guess I should do what I said I was going to do earlier. I should start by actually giving a quick history of the Frankfurt School, of the actual thinkers from a more generous perspective, not the Illuminati versions of them that we've seen from Lind. 
He actually gets most of the facts right. They were founded in the 1920s, were dedicated Marxists, and mostly believers in Freudian psychoanalysis. They were German, and mostly to a person, Jewish. But let's start with George Lukács, and his damning quote used so confidently by Lynn in the text, who will save us from Western civilization. That sounds like he wants to destroy the West, right? The white Christian world we all live in. But actually, this foundational quote from Lukács could not have been taken more out of context by Lynn. In full context, it is clear that Lukács was discussing the politics of World War I era Europe, which is important to understanding all of Frankfurtian thought. They were thinkers in the midst of a world on fire. The Western civilization in this quote is not how we normally use it, which means Teutonic and Roman peoples. He's talking about the West of Europe, France, England, and ultimately the US. He, a Hungarian, wants to be saved from French culture, a sentiment and I'm sure Lind would actually approve of. It just show that the philosophers we're talking about were trying to make sense of a civilization at war within and without. Soon they were to flee genocide of their own people. The thinking is very complicated if we put ourselves in that mindset. Similarly, Gromsky actually died at the hands of authoritarian Italy. Gromsky saw, as did the actual members of the Frankfurt School, that Karl Marx's economically focused dialectical materialism alone was not enough to explain or establish a functioning praxis for war-torn Europe. He saw a need to fight against the bourgeoisie's cultural hegemony, a codifying of self-serving ideology packaged as common sense to control the lower classes into backing fascist regimes. Rather than go into all of the thinkers of the Frankfurt School, it's probably helpful to talk about four of them. They are also the four most attacked by Lind and his staff writers. Theodore Adorno was a classically trained pianist and a founding member of the school. By and large, his chief contributions to Western thought were on the subject of culture, obviously, but also on the causes and psychology of the authoritarian figures that caused the Holocaust. He fled his native Germany in 1934 to escape the restrictive climate for German Jews. He lived in New York and Hollywood, where he unsuccessfully worked to write movies within the Hollywood system. His work was focused on the primitive nature of man. Despite all of the structures we create to elevate ourselves, we always collapse into barbarism. Our claimed virtue of noble self-sacrifice is just masking the same self-preservation we claim to be beyond. Adorno is actually searching for the answer, what could there be in life beyond the desire to merely persevere? I think that it is noteworthy to point out that Adorno conceded the impossibility of revolutionary economic communism before his death in 1969. It wasn't his aim to eradicate an entrenched capitalist system, but if it was, it was a self-admitted failure. Another giant figure of the Frankfurt School, Walter Benjamin, lived for eight years as a fugitive and an exile of the Nazi regime before he committed suicide rather than succumb to arrest, torture, and death. To call Benjamin a Marxist is almost so reductionist as to be a crime. He was obsessed with Jewish mysticism, not something we associate with Marxist praxis, and he sought a difficult writing style more akin to James Joyce and other modernists than the self-serious texts of Lukács and Gromsky. His his most influential work is the book The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In this, he argues that art used to have an aesthetic aura when it was a single work made by a singular artist to be possessed by a single person and enjoyed by them alone. But now we have modern production techniques to reproduce all manner of art. We have essentially made all art public. And since we have stripped art of all aesthetic auras making it public, we are now left with essentially political work, whether the artist intended it or not. To Benjamin, this is an exciting and egalitarian challenge to culture, one he hoped could be shaped, yes, towards Marx's goals. The only member of the school to have legitimate bestseller to his name is psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, most famous for his self-help manual, The Art of Loving. To Fromm, man is defined by his call to individual action and his relationship to authority. To highlight his vision of virtue, he goes all the way to the start. 
to the Garden of Eden. He views this story as imparting a dangerous message to all readers. The act of eating the apple could not be the original sin. Man is powered by his praxis, his call to individual action, using his own logic and his own reasoning, skewing the authoritarian demands of an unknowable God telling us his rules we are to blindly follow. This established Fromm's belief that many people are actually allergic to individual liberty, craving subjugation and authoritarian control over self-determination. This line of thought was not brought up by Lind for it would damage his story of Frank Ferdian's mad desire to control everyone. To Fromm, an individual either embraces his own self-determined freedom or he escapes it through three psychological methods, automaton conformity, authoritarian control over others, or destruction. He also defined love as a creative capacity, something other than a magic feeling that comes and goes beyond our control. He notes that humanity's greatest struggle with love is not even failing to understand our partner's needs, but to actually see them as something other than players in our own lives at all. And to show that the Frankfurt School is not a monolithic organization putting forth a unified message, I would point out that Fromm's chief critic is his fellow Frankfurtian, Herbert Moncusa. As I said earlier, Herbert Moncusa was a giant in the Frankfurt School. We spent some time with him while unpacking Lynn's book, and I'm not sure that Rain read the man too terribly wrong. He was a radical, in the best and the worst senses of the word. I suspect that Lind and his writers are more comfortable attacking Marcusa because he actually is the relative extremist he tried to make Adorno from and Gramsci seemed to be. Marcusa was the embodiment of the 1960s counterculture under which Lind probably bristled. Marcusa was a late entrant to the Frankfurt School, joining just before the whole school went into exile in 1932. During World War II, he actually worked for U.S. intelligence. He was considered the country's best German intelligence analyst and even worked at the State Department for years after the war. He actually was one of the communist infiltrators in the State Department McCarthy was rooting out. He went on to be an esteemed professor for Columbia University, Brandeis, and University of Cal, San Diego, where he led many campus demonstrations and mentored the popular Black Panther and political radical Angela Davis. As said before, he wrote the 1955 book Eros and Civilization, advocating a radical liberation of sexual mores in the country. He wrote the 1964 book The One-Dimensional Man, advocating a radical divesting of the post-war consumer culture and prescribing dropping out of the superstructure of American community in general. Basically, he was everything Lind accuses all Frankfurtians of being. But it would be ridiculous to claim that Herbert Moncusa alone was the single-handed destroyer of the West. That just doesn't sound right. Cultural Marcusanism doesn't roll off the tongue or strike fear in the heart. Marxism is a much scarier word than all of that. Marxism is Ivan Drago, it's Stalin and Pol Pot and Manchurian candidates and State Department files hidden in pumpkins. Quite frankly, a cabal of smarty pants European communist Jews are a much scarier villain to most conservatives than one tenured philosophy professor 38 years dead. One actually longs for an analysis of this cultural Marxism conspiracy theorist by actual Frankfurtians. Maybe a blog debate between Fromm and Marcusa himself. Lynn's unstated problem with the Frankfurt School seems to be that even in a time of American prosperity, these thinkers didn't turn their heads to the struggle of others, to the struggle of those that strong societies like that seen in the American 50s, 60s, and 70s often grind under their wheels. The Frankfurtians were not content with common order built on the backs of racial minorities, sexual minorities, and the poor. They even saw the contentedness itself of the era authoritarian and enslaving. They did not just call for change, they gave the sociological and the psychological justifications and the need for that change. And here's the thing about the Frankfurt School that gives their works power. They suffered from the very extremities of authoritarianism and racial extermination that they saw lying dormant in the TV sets and mod con kitchens of 1950s America. Lynn glosses over the very real pain that has been a part of most sensible people's understanding 
understanding of the Frankfurt School and their place in human thought. They are survivors. Survivors of the Nazis' extermination of the Jewish people in Eastern Europe. Survivors of the diaspora. Survivors of cultural scorn and systematic racism. Walter Benjamin committed suicide rather than succumb to the death at the hands of the SS. Hannah Arendt also had to escape in exile from Nazi hunters. Both of their works are considered key texts of Holocaust literature. Arendt and Adorno's chief works are focused on the mindset and the political function of totalitarianism, the political power that destroyed tens of millions of Europeans. The Frankfurt School were philosophers of loss, clear-eyed about the barbaric power relations that create inequity and the oppressive cultural hegemony of a superior class. More importantly, they saw in their own eyes that minor social inequities can become massacres in just a flash of an eye. My point is, this is not about a diabolical plot to reshape human history to destroy Western civilization. It is an advocacy for a greater, more inclusive civilization than the shit one most of us live in. Sadly, making a grand narrative of conspiracy out of the Frankfurt School seems like such a ridiculous overestimation of Theodorno's power that no one should take it seriously. He and Fromm and Marcusa have left a strong impact on academia, but not stronger than Hegel or Heidegger's or Foucault's, who no one would accuse of being a cabal of Marxists. Also, why does Lynn not attack American social justice philosopher John Rawls? His work is just as arguably disruptive to Western civilization and the established order order is it because an American Protestant saying the same things as the Frankfurt School is just not as scary? Were they profound thinkers? We can debate that, but there seems little doubt no matter what you think of their conclusions. Were they the flashpoint that changed American liberal studies in the 20th century? Sure, for whatever that's worth, they did that. Are they the reason we are living in a hell world right now? Fucking hardly. So what is really going on here? What is this claim to cultural Marxism really about? Here I'm going to admit some sleight of hand. I'm pretty sure that William Lynn's book is not the most complete and total conservative look at the Frankfurt School and the conspiratorial phenomenon of cultural Marxism. That belongs to writer Kevin MacDonald and his notorious book, The Culture of Critique. This was the third in a four-part series written by MacDonald on the nature of the Jewish people in the 20th century. His first two books were modestly received, portraying the history of the Jewish experience with anti-Semitism. But with Culture of critique, something changed. To quote McDonald, I think there is a noticeable shift in my tone from the first book to the third simply because I like to think I knew a lot more and had read a lot more. People often say after reading the first book that they think that I really admire the Jews, but they are unlikely to say that about the last two and especially about Culture of Critique. That is because by the time I wrote Culture of Critique, I had changed greatly from the person who wrote the first books. Culture of Critique follows Freudian psychoanalysts, Frankfurtian academics, and just general New York elite intellectuals. The book posits that these groups are all marked by Jewish identities and are acting in accordance to a plan to subvert white Christian America by shaping our culture our norms and our immigration policy. Now does this sound familiar? McDonald even puts the death of millions of Americans on these Jewish men. To quote the book, in the 20th century many millions of people have been killed in the attempt to establish Marxist societies based on the ideal of complete economic and social leveling and many more millions of people have been killed as a result of the failure of Jewish assimilation in European societies. He blames the Holocaust on the Jews. The result the result has been a widening gulf between the cultural successes of Jews and Gentiles and a disaster for society as a whole. I bet you thought I was being too cute by pointing out Hitler's love of the libelous term Kultur Bolshevismus. But this is a major academic author writing currently in America, accusing the Frankfurt School of doing the same things as the elders of Zion. The Southern Poverty Law Center calls McDonald's work nothing more than gussied up anti-Semitism. And that is what it is. McDonald's solutions to cultural Marxism is pretty telling to those trying to mask the anti-Semitism of his writing. He advocates total systematic discrimination of Jews in colleges and employment. He would also levy a Jewish tax to incentivize them to leave the country. Plainly spoken, this 
is Nazism. And they didn't need the Frankfurt School to exist to make it so. This bullshit snookered racist idiots like Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh well over a hundred years ago. The turn of the century's Protocols of the Elders of Zion wrote a provably false story of how Jewish leaders were subverting Western culture by debasing the morals, controlling media, and culture while also controlling the World Bank. This is the same goddamn story as Lynn wrote in his book, a hundred fucking years later. Twenty years before the Frankfurt School was ever fucking founded. And this is what the alt-right believes. This is what is taken as fact by most of the not-so-alt-right. Clever and devious Jews are using Muslims and blacks and Latinos to destroy the white race. I don't want to accuse William Lind of believing this because he doesn't express such anti-Semitism directly. Throughout Political Correctness and the accompanying video, he never once fully delves into the Jewish character of the Frankfurt School. But neither does Dufu Guy in his videos on the subject, or Sargon of Swindon, or Gorilla Mindset Guy, or any of these other fucking conspiracy theorists. And to the real alt-right, to people like Richard Spencer and Jared Taylor, that makes them alt-light. Too scared to bring up the JQ. But many aren't too afraid to bring it up, and anyone who reads Lind and wants to dig any deeper on the subject will soon discover this critique underlying the premises of this book, which is why we have events like what we saw at Charlottesville, Virginia, where the alt-right figures such as Spencer and Weave and Baked Alaska shouted that Jews will not replace them. They think that Herbert Marcuse is still working to enslave them 30 years after his death. And that belief is growing. You're probably thinking this is all I have to say about the subject. You're probably even hoping that this video is almost thankfully over. I can just wrap it up by calling Lynn and everyone who believes in cultural Marxism a big Nazi racist and fuck them and fuck off and shut them down and call it a day. Let's move on. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say something in William Lynn's defense. He is actually right to talk about the America of the 1950s. Something has changed, and not for the better. Something is corrupting and punishing most people today, more than it was during those halcyon days of yesteryear. And it's not what most liberals think it is. Yes, the 1950s was one of the most racially oppressive periods in our country, with punishing violence and social domination. It was marked by redlining, riots, lynchings, police brutality, and systematic injustice that was repugnant and undeniable. Knowing this should stop any possible defense of the 1950s and 60s as being anything like a moral high point for our country. And everyone of that time period that prospered were complicit in the extent of that inequity. No one is innocent in a society, especially a society constructed to openly discriminate against one group over the other. But even if we account for all of that horrendousness, apples to apples, Americans in general were happier and wealthier than they are today. Let's take a look at that era a little more critically. The average household income of 1955 was about $5,000. The average home cost about $7,500, or 50% more than the yearly household salary. The car our 50s father traveled to work in set him back somewhere between $1,300 and $2,300, or, you know, well under half a salary. Let's compare that to today. The average family income is $51,000. The average car costs $32,000, well over half our yearly salary. But the big shocker is is the home price. The average American home is now well over double, over triple, nearing a quadrupling of the average American income at $190,000. And even that isn't telling half the story. That stat of the average American income now includes two working parents, when before it only included one. That means new costs for childcare and after school watch totaling an average of $10,000 a year, or one fifth of the average household's yearly salary. This is on top of the average mortgage payment of $13,000 a year. College tuition for the children is now almost a must if you don't want them left behind. What cost the 1950s family $700 a year in tuition now costs $40,000, eating up almost 80% of the family's yearly income. And that is all per child. This is also taking into account that the average family is still paying off their own student debt to the tune of $3,500 a year. You can see the squeeze that modern families are under. Also, despite most basic consumer goods being cheap both in price and in quality, healthcare in this country has skyrocketed. In 1958, the total yearly health expenditure per person was $134 a year, or about half a month of wages. Today, that expenditure is $9,000 per person, about three months worth. What does this have to do with the Frankfurt School, you ask? 
Absolutely nothing. But please allow me one more line of discourse. Let's go all the way back to 1900 for a quick second and look at the American family then. The average yearly salary in 1901 was $450. The average home price was an almost astronomical $5,000, only a third less than it was 50 years later. That makes the average home price 10 times the average salary. There were no cars, which freed the average family from that expense, but it chained them to whatever circumstances to which they were born. Almost all healthcare was fee for service, so the poor were left to pray for charity or die if they struck ill, and college cost a hefty $450 a year, a full 100% of the yearly salary. So we are living slightly better than during the horrid days of the robber barons, but far worse than when Uncle Milty ran the airwaves. The happiness index follows this decline as well. We know that suicides, violent crime, single parenthood, divorce, and depression all track with the effects of the economic cycle. More to the point, it actually tracks with the effects of wealth inequality. Both the turn of the century and the modern age are under the drastic effects of wealth inequality. In the 1950s, not so much. From many standpoints, we are living in an age much like before the Great Depression, well before the average Frankfurt School figure ever translated works into English. As a cynical asshole, I want to take a brief moment to point out that the white picket fence Americana of the 1950s is bullshit. But some of it isn't really. I mean, not, not totally. Sure, you can point to things such as the incredibly high suicide rates of those older than 45 in the 1950s, which was a sad fact of the lack of elderly care in our country, which was soon corrected by the Medicare Act. And again, um, holy shit, if you weren't a white man back then, then you were just totally fucked. And if you were a cynical bastard like me, you would actually see that some of those things that were great about 1950s society, like Elks Lodges and cultural societies, were actually designed to ostracize and ghettoize blacks unmarried women from middle-class society. But for those in white America, things were better in the 50s than they had ever been and would be again. This did not happen on accident. It was the result of a generation of social improvements from Roosevelt's New Deal and the Great Society, which drove economic equality, aided social mobility, established social security, and eventually Medicare to protect our most cherished and vulnerable. All of this to strengthen the American family and especially the American working class. I agree with Lynn. In some ways, it would be nice to go back to these times, except with all of us now able to enjoy this shared social protections and benefits. All of us finally having a lasting, universally equal economic playing field. I have trouble believing that Adorno or Fromm or Mercusa wouldn't feel the same way if not being a little nitpicky and cranky about it. So why isn't this the case? What really changed? I have an answer for that. From Barry Goldwater's doomed presidential run, to Richard Nixon, to Ronald Reagan, to Bill Clinton, to the second Bush administration, until the fucking hell we live in right now, conservatives in this country have been efficiently and effectively dismantling every tenet that led to that improved lifestyle of the 1950s. Why would the working class let this happen to themselves? Allow people to take money away from them to give to the wealthiest, unneediest people in society? I posit, perhaps, like Gramsci and Lukács did in fascist Europe, perhaps these conservative radicals running the Republican Party knew that they needed to change the American man before they could take their money away and give it to the rich. They did this through the diabolical institution of the Chicago School of Economics with such secretly deceptive agents as Ronald Coors, Gary Becker, Milton Friedman, and the foul Robert Fogel who wrote on how American slaves actually lived better than those free workers in the North. They gave him a Nobel Prize for that theory. Fogel even wrote a book in 2000 showing how America was moving to a greater equality because of our religious character. History hasn't been kind to that view, has it? Milton Friedman is more influential than Marcusa ever was. Marcusa taught Angela Davis. Friedman taught Ronald Reagan. And the result is the world you live in today. You have the major political parties in this country driven almost solely by the unfounded belief that tax cuts for the rich are the greatest thing a country could 
give itself. Of course, most of these politicians and donors believe that they are in the top tier of the elite, those that stand to gain the most from this radical scheming. Couple this with a toxic manipulation through the gestalt of Madison Avenue marketing that has sold us a vision of ourselves that needs consumption to achieve success and happiness, addicting us to the need to consume, no matter what our salaries are, no matter what our actual needs are. This manipulates us into thinking that we are so close to being rich that we might as well start living that way. We should definitely vote that way, for we are sure to benefit from the dismantling of the social safety net that is currently driving us further into serfdom. Forever, someday in the future, we will be rich. And once being rich, we will thankfully, finally be happy. If that day never comes, if we never attain wealth, then it is because we ourselves are failures and deemed unworthy. Perhaps you could be so absorbed in this mindset they have forced upon you that you could champion the rise of some neo-feudalistic state that would enslave you to toil in the dirt, much like we did a millennia ago. You wouldn't be crazy to call this evil scheme cultural capitalism. Look at the ways that this type of cultural capitalism is basically just economic capitalism in a deceptive guise. Both are against human nature, so they must use authoritative methods to advance their goals. Despite what you have been told, it took humanity hundreds of thousands of years to develop macro-level capitalism, while humans have been practicing some form of socialism since the days of hunters and gatherers. It is natural within us. They must force you into participating in capitalism through wage slavery and resource scarcity. Similarly, cultural capitalism uses forced marketing, psychological warfare, and collusion to limit your consumption choices, forcing you to participate in a culture against your values. Two, both ideologies have a single factor explanation for history. For economic capitalism, the explanation is the market, a system fueled by the balance of risk and reward, enriching the bold and punishing the weakest actors. Similarly, cultural capitalism believes that the unyielding striving for unparalleled material success is the engine of all cultural advancement, is even the highest virtue of man. Greed is good becomes the mantra of this new religion of consumption. 3. Both ideologies define whole groups of people as evil a priori. For economic capitalism, this evil is that of the lazy moocher, draining off those productive citizens. These sorts cannot or do not choose to manufacture security for their lives because the flawed system doesn't make them. For cultural capitalism, the ire is usually directed at those that claim that the striving for material success is unrewarding and should be avoided. Whether they be Marcusean refuseniks or religious anti-materialists, they must be destroyed. The fourth parallel is expropriation. Economic capitalism focuses on the creative destruction of those things deemed not useful through monopolies, collusion, and straight theft in the guise of eminent domain. Similarly, cultural capitalism steals a person's choices, forcing everyone to conform to the choices deemed most profitable and convenient by the wealthy that control all of culture. And five, both rigidly employ a method of analysis designed to show their own correctness no matter the facts presented. Capitalists do this through market forces and cultural capitalists do this through trends, proving that any popular element of a culture illustrates the noble worth of the industry that forced it upon you. Your basis desires are in fact just the best choices you are making for yourself. I say that both of these excuses are phony analyses that twist evidence to fit the preordained conclusions, but it lends an air of inevitability to their ideology. Perhaps all of this is why you are unhappy today, why suicide rates for men are skyrocketing, why opioid addiction is reaching astronomical levels and the crime rate is edging up. Something has to explain the fact that we are all so miserable. But most importantly, someone has to explain why wealth inequality is this ridiculously out of control. That certainly isn't Marxism. And it isn't because you can't say the N-word in the break room or have to watch gay stuff on TV at night either. Quite simply, you are suffering because of cultural capitalism. Everything else is just making excuses. Okay, guys, I'm sorry, I, I really went for it there. Uh, 
And to be honest with you, I think I believe almost everything I said, to some degree or another. But what I'm hoping to highlight is the tone of conspiracy itself. Now, let's go back. Do I believe that the Chicago school has made America worse for its influence? I do. Do I think that they are a monolithic and shadowy cabal? Nope. Do I believe that they consciously implemented a plan to ruin the working class of this country? Uh, not really. It's kind of like how thalidomide was intended as an antidepressant. The destruction of the working class may be an effect of the drug, but not a feature. The thinkers of the Chicago School were wrong. They focused on what they wanted to focus on, were successful in achieving their goals, and most people are the worse for it. And for a right-leaning thinker, this is a perfectly reasonable response to Herbert Marcuse or Theodore Adorno. They were wrong, people suffer. What is not right, what is in fact dangerous, is when you see the people as knowingly evil, rubbing their hands together gleefully while people died in the streets. If they were evil, how can any action on your part, other than total threat elimination, not be woefully inappropriate? Make no mistake, by highlighting these handful of philosophers he doesn't like, Lind has started a fourth generational war in the minds of his readers. They are the stalwart knights of Western culture. What response other than overwhelming force wouldn't be inadequate? And to be honest, increasingly, I get it. Look guys, America isn't all going my way right now. My country is led by a person I detest. His administration is led by the worst amongst us, sporting ideologies that I believe threaten the future of my children's lives. I have to make these videos to stay sane. The idea of arming to the teeth and forming a line of like-minded and committed warriors of justice to challenge those forces that have ruined my country in the streets is awfully tempting. If someone was to create some grand theory of collusion and master plans hidden from view, it even elevates the necessity of what I'm wanting to do. Because the real truth is, fixing this country is going to be a fucking colossal task. If it was just some group of shadowy manipulators, then my job is that much easier. I can just eliminate the group and everything will start going back to normal. And that has always been the appeal of anti-Semitism. It is a brilliantly easy answer to every problem you could ever have. Hyperinflation, Jews. Unfair punishment due to the Treaty of Versailles, Jews. Are whites starting to feel the same effects of deindustrialization that blacks felt decades ago? That's the Jews. The city took away your Nazi protest permit? Of course that was the Jews. If some black guy fucked your wife? That's probably also the Jews. This is the reason that the cultural Marxist myth has spread so far in our culture. Some Jewish Marxists wrote things about philosophy decades ago with which you disagree. This should be a benign enough act, but... What if it was all a scheme to secretly oppress you and your desires using methods outside of your understanding? No reasonable person would blame the Frankfurt School for their own town's last factory laying off workers. A reasonable person wouldn't blame them for feeling inadequate and alone in our society. But honestly, when you're depressed, lonely, unfulfilled and unemployed, reason is not your strongest functioning trait. And that isn't just a problem on the right. It's a problem in all of us, but few of us have a solid framework to organize what we are seeing before us. Many liberals woke up depressed and shocked on November 9th, 2016. I know I did. We couldn't explain what we had just seen. It didn't fit with the framework view we had of the world. And we wanted to blame something. We wanted to blame Russians and racists and Bernie bros and Jill Stein, but I, I would tell the depressed liberals and the lonely, isolated culture warriors fearing the Frankfurt School, you have to blame the current system. You have to blame your framework of view. That is what is actually destroying these things in your life. Blame the policies you didn't know were passed. Blame the politicians that you didn't show up to vote against. Blame yourself for allowing this to happen in your town and against your own self-interests. Educate yourself and read. And maybe, just maybe, Karl Marx and these Frankfurtians have a thing or two to say that might help you understand your problem better. That was, after all, their honestly stated goal. Or maybe I'm just a secret cultural Marxist Frankfurtian myself, trying to cloud your mind and turn you into sheep for the slaughter.
Never be held back by the rangers' hour No reaction without pain 